and welcome to another Ask Julie Anything. I am Mariana Nadai, and I will be your host today. April is here, which means that it's already spring se uh, season, so it's time to talk about a very popular topic, allergies. So many animals have allergies, whether to environmental triggers or food, and we see and hear about them all the time. That's why during today's session, our co-founder, co founder and formulator, Julianne Lee, will deliver a presentation covering all things allergy related. After the session, Julie will be answering your questions about this topic, so don't be shy and ask Julie anything. And before we start, I want to remind you about some housekeeping rules. I will ask for you all to switch your chats to everyone so, um, so uh, we all can join in the conversations. Please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen to ask your questions. Your questions will be answered in order, first come, first serve, and we will do our best to get through all of them tonight. And the most important thing of, uh, of all, I also want to remind you that this session provides a judgment-free space with only the health and happiness of our animals and the planet being our core goal. So without further ado, Julie and Lee, everyone. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm just, um, uh, hold on, for our doors. There we go. Um, so yeah, it is allergy season and it's, uh, today's been a really like emotional day for ABA good, in a good way, in a good way. Um, Every, a lot of you guys know that I've been working on a cancer project and uh, we've had some really amazing news and it has been uh, published in two really, really, really high level peer reviewed medical journals. So Dalhousie University was really excited. So they did a press release on it today. So my, my amazing business partner, Dion Albert, that you guys all know about, um, who's like the most amazing business partner and best friend in my whole life. He is so completely supportive of, of all of this. And, you know, none of this is making ABA any money, but, uh, cancer is a big, big deal. And so are allergies. So that's what I was going to say. It's like ABA started with our leaky gut protocol. And one of the reasons that that happened was because of my practice, just a little backstory on, on allergies and stuff. Um, in my practice, I, we just saw thousands of animals that would come in and with no alternatives, you know, we're going to put our dogs to sleep or our cat to sleep because we've done every single drug or they're, you know, they've been on steroids for four years and their cartilage and their knees are going, or we can't stand the smell and nothing's working. And what are we going to do? And like just distraught. And then the other part of that is that it's horrible. Like it's such a, it's such a, um, constant con can sometimes be lifelong suffering. And I'm again, you guys know me pretty well. I think some people, most people do. And one thing is really difficult for me is any kind of suffering. Like I think I have actually a problem with it. So um uh I, I can't send things suffering if I see something on a road or a frog getting run over. Like I have a huge thing about that. So I went to a conference in 1997. And I remember one of the vets that was lecturing, she was an SBCA vet and, and said that one of the reasons that one of the main reasons for euthanasia was skin disease. And when I sat there, I had just sort of started my practice and I was just blown away to think that um, cancer was the number one reason for death, but elected euthanasia reasons why people came in and, and, and chose to euthanize their, their pets was for skin out for allergies for skin disease so i really went back to my practice and i just started digging into everything like what is it about what is it what is this thing how is this you know how is this possible and it it, it was one of the reasons that i dove into um gut health and the microbiome and you know uh so 
when I met Dion and we decided that we were going to do um, start up Adored Beast Apothecary. And for those of you that don't know, Adored Beast Veterinary Clinic was the re reason we have Adored Beast Apothecary was Adored Beast um, was the name of my vet, my very first veterinary hospital. And uh, I said to him, like, it was, it was really crazy. We talked and we, you know, he was like, do you have anything for allergies? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, and I wanted to put out the leaky gut protocol and everybody, every single business advisor, every single, everybody was well, like, are you insane? Like, are you seriously going to be a company? And when you open the door, you're going to put out a, a protocol for leaky gut that no one even knows what leaky gut is like, like you're going to fail in your first year so I talked to Dion about it and he said you know what don't listen to anyone let's just do what we think we should do so we 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 launched the leaky gut protocol so you know cancer is a big deal for me I saw thousands and thousands of cases and worked on thousands of cases of cancer um, in my practice and and so is allergy so it's interesting that we're we're talking about two things that are very near and dear to my heart today so without further ado, and on a good note, I was planting seeds today. So that was really fun and nice. And um, it's the first time I've done that in a very long time. So yeah, very springy. But along with that comes allergies for people, allergies for our, our pets. So let's dig into what allergies are. My... Um, my understanding of them, working with them for close to 30 years now. And some sort of just my take on them and how I approach them with my own life, my my family, my my animal families, and my my patients at my at my clinics. So but one thing I'm not very good at and is technical stuff. So um uh we are having a bit of a te technical difficulty that I can't open up my slides. So Mariana has to be my my projector. Yes, I'll be. I'll, <laughs> and I'll have today. Yeah. Let me share my so screen here. I'm literally gonna have to say to her next to to change slides, but then um so apologies for that. All right. Okay. So Blossoms are one of my most favorite things. I think it's one thing I miss the most about living in Vancouver was the blossoms are everywhere already, the cherry blossoms. But along with that comes all kinds of allergies. So the first thing I want to talk about, and, and um, I sort of discovered this about 20 years ago, I guess, well, 10 years about 15, 15, 18 years ago, was the real difference between an allergy and a reactivity and a sensitivity. So what's the difference? So an allergy is something, they're very, very similar, but your animal can have, can look like it has a full-blown allergy to like chicken or dust mites or pollen. And really what it is, is it's a reactivity or a sensitivity. And when we get, um, uh, there's many different ways of testing for allergies and a lot of the amazing tests, like the saliva test that Jean, Dr. Jean Dodds does, uh, it shows the sensitivity or what is creating the, the immune response to react to certain proteins or um, antigens, like I said, like flea saliva or dust mites or pollen. So I'm a homeopath. Everybody knows that. And one thing that I might differ from, from everybody else, is that I don't necessarily always w need or even want a specific diagnosis. And I don't need to have your dog, your cat, your horse, your human, your person um, has been diagnosed with X, Y, and Z. And sometimes it's great. And sometimes it's actually not so great. And the not so great part of that is that then we get pigeonholed. Okay, my dog's allergic to chicken. 
my cat's allergic to flea saliva, my this, my that. And it 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 is it is is good. And we're gonna go into why that's it's good, but it's often unnecessary. So when it what I'm basically saying is if you're if you're if you if you're at this webinar or AJA and you're coming to the table where you are you've tried everything you're you're and you're choosing to go on an alternative route or an integrative medicine route or a natural route to help your animal either prevent allergies or work with allergies that you have i'm basically telling you it doesn't matter if it's an allergy or it's a sensitivity and i'm hoping that's going to give you a little bit of uh relief um and we'll go into why later but it doesn't really matter Okay. So that brings me into, do I need an allergy test? So when you're looking at an allergy test, you, we have to think about the financial aspect of it. They can be incredibly expensive and not always hugely helpful. What's the end result of this testing? It can be helpful where it can be helpful is by a for us to remove what we know for sure that they're reactive to. So if I was seeing a dog at my clinic or a cat or a horse, it doesn't matter, and I'm looking at an allergy test and I see that this, this animal is allergic to um, beef or chicken. So there's, there's a couple proteins in there that they're allergic to. It might be allergic to some squash. They could be allergic to you know, I don't know, um, some kind of environmental thing, some kind of grass. And why it's helpful is that while we're dealing with the root cause, we can try to reduce suffering. We can try and eliminate some of these things that they're allergic to in order to have the body go, okay, whew, I have a little bit of reprieve so I can focus a little bit more on healing or focus a little bit more on immune modulation, which we're going to get into, or just focus more in general. Saying that, it's really expensive. Sometimes you get it, and it's the most depressing thing that you've ever seen in your life because they're allergic to everything. They're allergic to dust mites, flea saliva, pollen, all these different kinds of grasses. You're reading this allergy test and going, how could they possibly be allergic to X, Y, and Z. I've had my puppy since it was eight weeks old. It has never eaten this. Like, and now it's saying that it's allergic to this. So it can be, it can be helpful and it can be expensive and frustrating. So an alternative to that is elimination, right? So how are you going to eliminate dust mites? How are you going to, other than vacuuming like crazy, how are you going to eliminate um, certain kinds of grasses or pollen or, you know, the environmental stuff? How are we going to eliminate that? It's really hard. So what you want to do is you want to go, okay, what's, what's, what are the, what are the triggers that could be environmental? Like, and what can we do about them? So I don't know that my dog's allergic or my cat's allergic to dust mites, but it might be. So I'm going to be super careful and I'm going to vacuum all the time and I'm going to be anal about washing their blankets and washing my sheets and try to keep dust down to a minimum. I'm going to use organic cotton sheets. I'm not going to use synthetics, which which dust mites and different kinds of yeast and stuff love synthetics. They don't like bamboo, cotton. They don't like organic material as much as they like synthetics. Uh, we're going to look at, you know, washing their legs when they come in from outside, like rinsing them off with like a chamomile tea to try and eliminate bringing in pollens. Um, we can take a damp, a damp rag and we can wipe them off with a damp rag of, of a chamomile tea when they come in the door so that we're just taking the top layers of any kind of dusts and pollens and things that may have accumulated on their hair while they've been outside or their fur while they've been on outside. Now, from a from a diet perspective, we can do novel proteins. And what that means is that if you've had your dog for X amount of time, or your cat or your horse, and you know that they've never had a specific protein, well, horses not so much, but could be a, a specific kind of hay, 
you know that they haven't had that. So you're going to try one, not three different kinds of proteins, but you're going to try one type of protein that you really don't think that they've ever had. And then you're going to look at maybe novel, novel vegetables as well. Like have they had rutabaga? Have they had, you know, a different kind of, of, you know, look for a, a, a unique vegetable that gives them, you know, what, what they need. Don't get too freaked out about, oh, they don't have enough, um, you know, my, they're not going to have enough diversity in their diet. They're, and you know me, I'm like the diverse queen, but they don't have enough diversity in their diet. Don't worry. I, I, I can tell you and I can say to you right now, don't worry about that because for three months, they are not going to die on one protein and one or two different kinds of vegetables. So long as they're getting their calcium and things like that, so that you're using the same bone as the protein that you're, that you're going to be feeding. So let's use duck. Let's just use that. So you're going to be feeding duck meat or you're going to feed llama meat. You want to make sure that you're using the, the, the bone of that animal in order to get the, the calcium. So you're not going to add like some kind of fish calcium, or you're not going to add a, a chicken calcium or chicken bone meal or chicken something to a, to a beef something. You're going to stay with that one novel protein all the time. So that's, that's alternatives to actually going ahead and doing an allergy test. The other thing that happens with allergy tests is when you'll, you'll see an allergy come at you see, you'll see a, a test result come back and it's like, honest to goodness, it's allergic to everything. When you see something like that, in, in my opinion, in, in my experience of, of seeing thousands of blood work um, and working with thousands of patients this way is, and that's how I came up with leaky gut is I would look at this stuff and people would be like, how? How, how is my animal allergic to all this? Or why is this on the, on the side where it's not recommended? Like, how, what am I going to feed my animal? It's it, nothing is recommended. It seems like it's reactive to everything. I would say 99% of the time or 95% of the time, that's a leaky gut issue. Because what's happening is that everything that they're coming into contact with it, they're coming into contact with it they're on their skin, and then it finds their way in, in internally, whether in they're inhaling it, whether they're ingesting it, it doesn't matter. It's going into where it's supposed to go, which is into the gut. And then from the, from the gut, it's supposed to be um, um, filtered. And it's not, it's, 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 it's going in, it's not filtered. It's stay, it's not being able to stay in the gut where it's supposed to stay. And it's going into, it's seeping into the bloodstream. The minute it seeps into the bloodstream, the, the, the body overreacts. It goes, holy crap. What is going on here? Why, why are all of these antigens, these aren't these enemies coming into the body? So the body becomes overreactive, hyperimmune. Um, autoimmune is, 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 a is the sort of the, the, the stage that happens because the body can't shut off because it's constantly being bombarded by what it thinks is an enemy. Okay. So this is what leaky gut looks like. And this is an, this is not a leaky gut, um, uh, webinar, but we have to, we can't talk about allergies unless we talk about um, leaky gut or, or gut health. We just, we just can't. We can look at all different ways and what happens with that. And that's what I'm going to do because everybody kind of understands leaky gut, but they don't really understand. I would say the, the, the makings of it, what it looks like from an allergies perspective and how do we deal with it other, other than just even healing the gut. How do we deal with that? So, you know, the first thing that happens is the 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 body is supposed to detoxify through its skin. Our skin is the biggest organ, including your animals. Our their skin is the biggest um, detoxifying or organ. It's bigger than the liver and the kidneys and the gallbladder, and and it 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 is our first form of defense and. What happens is, is they've, if they've got an allergy, then then often their skin is compromised because you're washing the, 
daylights out of it. You're scrubbing it, you're washing it, you're using ketoconazole, you're using like a, a, a an anti yeast, an anti um, antibacterial, antimicrobial, and all this stuff on their skin, and you're stripping their skin of its natural microbiome, and therefore it's not able to eliminate even the the allergies that they're getting or the, the the chemicals or the pollens and things that they're getting outside so the first form of defense is already um compromised then when the gut becomes um the 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 gut integrity the lining of the gut the integrity breaks down you can see one side is a normal gut one side is a leaky gut and it's not difficult to see right so pathogens, food particles, chemicals, um, you name it, the, um, you know, inhaling, even in inhalants and anything that's in our food, right? Or in the food that we feed our animals, if there's any kind of glyphosates, if there's any kind of pathogenic bacteria, if there's any kind of, any kind of chemicals at all, um, you know, when you're giving them advantage or when you're doing any kind of, um, uh, you know, worming medicines, antibiotics, anti-inflammatories. So they should all be able to be up on that first level and contained. And then the gut does its job and it when it when it allows that to go through, it's already detoxified. The food particles are broken down and it becomes a vitamin. So the bacteria of the gut actually synthesis synthesizes and converts their food into 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 um their vitamins and then that's the way that this that our bodies and their bodies are supposed to work when the junctions are open and have been stretched and traumatized all of that stuff goes straight through and it goes into the bloodstream and you can see where it says transcellular and paracellular. And then when you look below inflammation and abnormal immune reaction, because <laughs> if, when you look at those pretty little circle things that, that Mar did, um, that kind of shows that symbiotic, um, in perfect harmony, what's supposed to be coming through and, and entering into the bloodstream that creates um, nutrition and and cellular balance and immune balance and things like that. So when that doesn't happen, it 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 the exact opposite happens. And the body goes into the state of, oh my God, we are under attack. Because everything in my bloodstream right now is either in macro doses, like food, macro doses that I can't, don't even know what to do with because it's not giving me any kind of nutrition or it is all of this, all chemicals and, and, um, uh, you know, all the things that aren't supposed to be in my bloodstream are in my bloodstream now. And, you know, pollution, like you name it, that's not supposed to happen. That's supposed to be detoxified by the gut. But when it isn't, it goes straight into the bloodstream and the body goes crazy and just starts to attack everything. Okay. So part of that attacking um, is uh, can go into a true allergy and it can be a, a reactivity. So the reactivity is they're reactive because it's in the bloodstream. An allergy can be where it it grabs one of those things like a passive antigen that should not be reactive. So chicken shouldn't be reactive. Beef shouldn't be for a canine should not be reactive. Any kind of protein should not be a reactive antigen. But if their body is in such a state of, of alert, they have to kill something. So they wind up killing these passive antigens and then saving them as an antibody and that can become a true allergy. So, but they look alike and we deal with them the same way. So that's why I don't want you to get too caught up in that and, and trying to like pinpoint it and nail it down. So when we talk about allergies, reactivities, doing tests, whatever, 
what we're doing by elimination diet. So if I say to you, you're allergic to a tomato, so don't eat tomatoes. Or your cat's allergic to chicken, don't feed your cat chicken. Your dog is allergic to, to lamb, don't feed your dog lamb. Your blah, 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 the list goes on. What we're doing is we're we're stopping poking the bear. Okay, so we're we're not going bing, 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 you know, hey, look, look, look. We're 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 giving, we're not poking the bear. The problem is you need to remove the bear. So it's like, okay, there's a bear in you have to go bear, like go live in somebody else's body. <laughs> because not only am I not gonna poke you, but I'm actually gonna take you and I'm gonna take you into the woods and let you go and live somewhere that you're supposed to be living. <laughs> And not in my body or in my dog's body or my cat or my horse's body where you're creating havoc all the time. So allergies and removing, testing and removing what they're allergic to does not remove the bear. It does not remove the exciting cause. It does not remove the reason for the allergies. And then what happens? I bet you every single person out there knows um, what happens is then they just become allergic to something else because you're not removing the cause of why they're having the allergies. So everybody knows what the immune system is and everybody knows that, you know, when you have a heightened immune system, you have an autoimmune disease. So your immune system is way too high. So then the autoimmune diseases are allergies our reactivities, our Cushing's is um, anything where the body is attacking itself because the immune system is overreactive. And how you'll know that, whether your animal has a type of overreactivity or a type of um, uh, uh, autoimmune disease is if they go on anything like atopica, venectal P, prednisone, um the the immune suppressive drugs so when we look at this what we have what i how i look at this and when i was really starting to dig into gut health and understanding okay like we want it we can take we can give it echinacea we can do all of this stuff for viruses and colds and and bacteria right like we even have antibiotics and we have all of this stuff that supports us to heal from an underactive immune system. So immune system, you know, in the in the 90s and the early 2000s, all we would hear is like boost your immune system, boost your immune system, boost your immune system. And now we're in a in a place where it's like, oh gosh, we're not uh, boosting anything. We are built, but you'll still hear that, you know, boost the immune system. Um, but we're hearing more, we're hearing more about chronic disease and autoimmune disease and cancers and all that. And in that place, we're, we're, we're needing to suppress the immune system from a conventional point of view. So conventional medicine, when you, when they see a, um, an autoimmune disease, they want to suppress it. They need to, they need to give a suppressive an immune suppressive drug in order to stop that overreaction and stop the body attacking itself and anything that's in its bloodstream. And when it runs out of something in its bloodstream, then it starts to attack its own cells and cause all kinds of havoc. So we need to address the underlying root cause. And in my personal experience, my experience in my practice, my experience in gut health, in, in working with um, natural medicine and looking at health in a different perspective, the biggest key is immune modulation. So immune modulation means, sorry guys, immune modulation means um, when the body, and this is, this is how our immune system should work when it's healthy, is if it goes too high, it brings it down naturally. If it goes too low and it's like, oh, my immune system is low, so I'm susceptible to bacteria, to viruses, things like that, then it brings it back up. So your body, your animal's body, our bodies have the natural ability to modulate its own immune system. And when it can't, it's usually because, usually 
because of factors like not having the correct bacteria in the body that gives the body the signals to modulate, come down, go up, go up, come down. So, okay, next one, please. So what do, what do we do? What do, what do we want to do when we're looking at immune modulation? So um, whether you know the root cause or not, we can know for sure and sit sit in a place where if our animals have allergy symptoms, reactivity, sensitivities, or anything even worse that, that are immune um, is, is uh, autoimmune related, we really, really want to focus on allowing the body and giving the body the tools to modulate. And I can't tell you how excited I was when I first started doing research and that aha moment when I understood that certain bacterias modulate the immune system. They have immune modulating properties and certain prebiotics have immune modulating properties. So you want to make sure, you want to make a thousand percent sure that when you're feeding a probiotic, that you're using a pre or probiotic to um, that modulates that have been that's been scientifically proven to modulate the immune system. So the bacteria basically um, sends out the signal to the immune system if it's too high to bring it down, if it's too low, it brings it back up. So when you focus on the gut, when you're thinking specifically allergies um, or, or reactivity and sensitivity, you want to make sure that you're working with immune modulating ingredients or things that have immune modulating properties. And a lot of people can say that, but when you have an animal that's really, that you know, I'm sure that everybody's listening here knows what it's like to be dealing with an animal with an allergy and it's heartbreaking, right? Because they're in constant, you know, constant chaos and constant wearing cones and shirts and it's it, chewing themselves. It's, it's brutal. The next thing you want to do is bring down cortisol levels. So this is something that doesn't cost any money. And it's good for you and it's good for your animals, but it is incredibly, incredibly important. So when cortisol's high, the, the body becomes, um, or adrenaline's high, the, the body becomes in a state of alert. And it's, and it's very difficult, if not impossible, to heal when you're in a state of fight or flight. So when the body goes into fight or flight, it, it goes into this place where it's like, okay, I either need to run, I'm going to get eaten by something, you know, I'm going to get attacked or I'm going to get eaten by something. So I have to either choose to turn around and fight for my life or run for my life. When you're running or fighting, your body is not anywhere in the, the, the atmosphere of healing. Um, it was why it was so important at my clinic that that I remember the, like the first clinic I had, and when it came to surgery times, it 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 was like being at a spa, because I knew that they had to go under a general, being as calm as they possibly could, and they had to wake up in that space as well in order to start that that healing process. And, you know, people went home with really detailed information of how to reduce stress after surgeries or even a, a sick animals. How do you, how do we reduce the stress so that the body actually can say to itself, okay, it's time to heal. Part of that is exercise, paying attention. I think we've got lots of blogs and things like that on, on Adored Beast about reducing stress, stress levels in animals. Um, uh, anti-inflammatory diets that's another one that 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 we can you know that we can really work on a lot a lot as well with a lot of um uh eliminations if you're if you're really dealing with something that's in an actual allergy perspective then then you need to start eliminating things and you know it's really easy like look at the 
the gap diets, things like that. It's not difficult to, to look at what are inflammatory foods, what aren't inflammatory foods and stay with the, the, the non-inflammatory foods. Now, another thing that we have to really talk about is histamine, right? So histamine, everybody knows what histamine is. Uh, we take Benadryl and animals take Benadryl and, um, Venectyl P is an antihistamine slash steroid. So, you know, it's a combination. And a large majority of the stimulation and the regulation of histamine comes from the liver. So you want to make sure no matter what, if you're dealing with an animal with an allergy, that you're supporting the liver big time. And, you know, our liver tonic, I know that's it's there. We don't have to use our liver tonic, but I'm 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 also want to explain to you because I really really want you guys to to have the tools to help your animals with allergies. When we think about when an animal has leaky gut or an animal has allergies and things are seeping into the bloodstream that not aren't supposed to be there, so whether you believe in leaky gut, whether you don't, it doesn't matter. If your animal has an allergy or a reactivity, you can be guaranteed that things are going into their bloodstream that should not be there. When it's in their bloodstream, then the liver kicks in and tries to detoxify. It, it, it puts more stress on the liver. So I'm someone that doesn't believe in, in compartmentalizing the body. I think the body, every single, every single cell, every single organ, every single system of the body supports itself. So when we're looking at the liver and if the liver is going to be, you know, um, overtaxed, it's only a matter of time that the pancreas is going to kick in and try to be like its secondary buddy and the kidneys and the gallbladder. All of those, those organs are going to try even energetically to, to support the liver when the liver starts to get overtaxed. So my belief system is that you don't just treat the liver. You don't just support the liver. You support all of it. You support the pancreas. You support like why wait, you know, you're, you're working on the liver and then all of a sudden your animal's got pancreatitis. It's like, let's let's or it's kidney values start to go up so why not support all of that at the same time so that they can work as a team to get that to detoxify the body correctly okay so you know we have things like our uc beast protocol um that there's lots of things that we can you know that you can go into because you know with allergies comes along a lot of initially antibiotics. So you're probably wondering like, why am I even talking about yeast when we're talking about um, allergies or why are we talking about the leaky gut protocol when we're talking about allergies? And I want to tell you why, because whether you get it from us or whether you get it, you just, you just understand the thought process of these and why they work for allergies and why I developed them at my, at my clinic for allergies is that when an animal has allergies, they get itchy and then they scratch and then they open up their skin and then they get something called secondary staphylococcus often. So a lot of times, or they get like yeasty ears because they're not because they've got initial yeast in their ears, but because they become so inflamed and they're itching their ears and they're itching all over. And then the, the, the actual skin of the eardrum becomes swollen and then not as much air gets down inside. And then that's a perfect like home for yeast um that dark dank you know moist that moist area um so you put they're put on antibiotics and then the minute they're put on antibiotics then it destroys the natural bacteria in the gut when it starts to destroy the 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 friendly bacteria in the gut the the yeast then goes yahoo amazing all of our so soldiers that were keeping us at bay are now gone. So now I'm going to, the yeast is just going to have a heyday and flourish, right? So we often see yeast coming after original um, allergy symptoms or being treated originally for, for allergies. And the same holds true with leaky gut, right? Well, we know we talked about, you know, like what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Does the leaky gut come first? Does the, 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 the sort of the allergies and then the antibiotics and then the destroying of the, the gut 
microbiome and then the and then the trauma to the gut lining and then like it doesn't matter this is a cool thing it's it, it's so it's so cool and so amazing and so uh it gives a lot of hope for people with animals with allergies is that it doesn't have to be that scientific from a perspective of it doesn't have to be scientific it has to you have to understand it and i'm such a science nerd clearly so I like to know all of it, but at the end of the day, my, my focus goes into how does nature do it in the wild? How does it, how do it, how does it balance itself in the wild? How does it do this in the wild? I want to learn from that and then put it into, um, tangible tools and tangible ingredients that then we can do to al allow the body to heal itself. So the, you know, the leaky gut protocol we're always looking at liver tonic. You can see liver tonic in both of these right away, right? And that's because in any case with almost anything, including cancer, you want to be supporting the liver. So the liver is a big one all the time to make sure that we're supporting. So you can go through and you can work with a lot of this stuff. And um, and it, it it's a it's a it's a process that that the why these two are out here like this is because sometimes we have uh, uh, an emergency sort of protocol that that our customer service can give you guys and that's when you have an animal that's got everything like like literally everything and believe it or not that's probably the majority of them so they've got yeast they've got underlying leaky gut then they've got yeast infection henry then they've got yeast infections and they've got um, you know, traumatized gut linings and they've got, um, you know, they're just beside themselves and they just, we don't, you don't even know what's going on with them. So what we can do with something that's that bad is that we rotate through these. So we try to do the healing process in the least, um, intense way so that we we're slowly healing. We're dealing with one thing and then we it's almost like you you um trick the body and you you switch gears and then you you add the different protocol and then you switch your gears again and you go into like phytos flora um customer service has it we guys probably can put it in in the chat it's one it's for it's been it's been a godsend to many animals that look that are just like really really in a bad place so the philosophy behind that is not just going in and dumping in the big guns and then they detoxify and then they get worse and then they go back to the back to the clinic and they're like oh well now your yeast is worse actually my yeast isn't worse i'm getting a die off your animal's getting a die off it's getting a herx reaction where the yeast is dying too quickly and then it looks identical to a, a, a yeast infection that's getting worse and it's not you're just killing the yeast too quickly so We've got tons and tons of information and, and people want to put, you know, questions and, and things like that in in the in the chat. You can definitely do that for when we can answer some questions. But, you know, working working with the body to heal the gut lining, which to me is often the bear you know, stop poking the bear, you know, remove things that you know that the body is, is reactive to start doing elimination diet to calm the whole system down, um, try to reduce stress, you know, bring in more exercise, spend a bit more attention with them. Um, definitely don't isolate them because that happens a lot because they they're stinky or something and then start adding immune modulation, right? So, so when we look at um, I'm just going to go through this quickly with you too, is that, uh, the 14 strains like love bugs and healthy gut and gut soothe, their immune modulation is something called Larch. So Larch is, is been proven to be an immune modulator. Um, all of our species oriented probiotics, our wolf, our, uh, Phytos flora, our Felix flora, um, they've been, they've they have studies of the yin yang that they have immune modulated pro properties They're, that those bacteria are immune modulators so we know that by adding those we're already saying to the to the body 
okay, you can do this. We don't need to suppress your immune system and then boost your immune system and then suppress your immune system. And, and you know, now I'm talking fast because I want to get through this with you guys, but this is what I saw all the time. It's like you'd go on antibiotics, the gut would get trashed, then they'd get yeast, then they'd start scratching, then they would go on more antibiotics, then the gut is even get gets worse. And it's just this, this constant you know, rabbit hole that they keep going down. So by putting the, the, the modulation perspective, the elimination perspective and the cortisol level perspective in the liver, you look at those, those tangible tools and you can get so far with allergies and, and reactivities. It's incredible. Okay. Next. So what are immune suppressive drugs? So we talked about this already a bit of the P, prednisone, steroid injections, probi probiotics. I don't know why that's in there. <laughs> oh, I know. Okay. So probiot, what is natural suppressive? Like what can we use instead? So we can use probiotics. We can use bromelain. Okay. This, this, I didn't get to look at the slides guys. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so Let's just not look at that for a second. Um, no, you want to go back just for a second. Marianne, just go back there for a minute, please. Thanks. So immune suppressive drugs on this list is venectal P, prednisone, steroid injections, atopica, and apical. So those, if your animal has or is on that, your animal is on an immune suppressive drug. So when when you look at immune suppressive drugs, immediately you should be looking at immune modulation because you, you can't live a normal thriving life on an, on an immune suppressive drug because then the immune system goes too far down. Then you have to go on antibiotics because you can't fight viruses and you can't fight infections, things like that. That's why their, their skin gets so bad. Um, you know, because the, the secondary bacteria is landing on their skin and their immune system is so suppressed that then they get secondary bacteria. Okay. You can go to the next one now. So natural antihistamines, um, those other ones should have been on this list guys. Sorry. So it's quercetin, liver tonic, spirulina, probiotics, bromelain, turmeric, and omega-3s. Those are all natural antihistamines. Those all um, uh, help the body to naturally suppress or regulate. I don't even like using the word suppress, but regulate the histamine responses in the body. The liver, like I mentioned before, is one of the major organs that regulates histamine. And histamine is the, is the thing that we really have to be careful with when it comes to, to allergies. And you want to try and reduce those or keep them at their regular, at the regular, um, at the regular levels. Okay. Um, so best uh, choices for prevention, make sure the gut lining has that integrity. Um, ensure that you're feeding the gut the types of bacteria that support the immune modulation and make sure that the liver uh, is clean. And we do that. We, you know, it's sort of what's the state of the gut right now? Was your dog or cat born with a, with a really, really powerfully healthy gut microbiome? Was it born with a really poor microbiome? You know, when they're young, you don't often see that you start seeing it when they're a little bit older, you want to keep them on the cleanest diet as you can. You want to make sure that their environment is clean, meaning, you know, air quality, uh, organic, I don't mean certified organic, I'm talking organic, like cotton, bamboo is like the best thing. Uh, if you look on any of my furniture, every single piece of my furniture has something like bamboo or cotton on it. Um, all the dog beds have it on because it's really hard to be sure that it's 100% cotton. Uh, Cleaning the environment, that's what we just talked, and don't overbathe. That's a big one. If you need to, um, if you need to, we talked about that, having a damp, having a damp um, washcloth with like chamomile tea or green tea, wiping off the, the in 
what could be environmental uh, contributors like pollen and different types of dust, uh, spraying their legs down or dipping their legs when they come in with chamomile. Uh, chamomile tea is like one of my favorites. Uh, just don't overbathe them because then you're destroying the, the, the really, really beneficial bacteria that's on their skin. Okay. All right. Well, that was a fast, I tried to be as fast as possible, but um, we'll have to try and, and go through some questions now. Yes. Let me open here the Q&A box to start reading all the questions. We have a few now. <laughs> so Amanda is asking, my dog will moan and groan while while lying down after eating. He also licks his paws quite a bit after a meal. It looks like he's doing it more to comfort himself rather than itchiness being the cause. I'm wondering if a food sensitivity um, could be causing bloating or acidity reflux. A couple of foods showed up on a NutriScan test that our vet recommended measures IgA and IgM antibodies. I'm not sure how accurate it is. What are some lesser known symptoms of food allergy sensitivities? Is an elimination diet the only way to know which foods might be causing issues considering the leak gut protocol? Thank you. Yeah, so the NutriScan test is the one I was talking about with Gene Dodds. It's a really, really good one. Um, and it does show IgA and IgG antibodies. It is, it's really accurate. It's quite accurate. But again, you're only finding out what, what they're sensitive to. You're not really, um, like I said, you, you can stop poking the bear, but you're not removing the bear. So, so these are all super helpful, like really, really helpful. And, but what I'm listening to is, is a hundred percent, food sensitivities and food allergies does not have to show up as itching. It can show up as, as bloating, nausea, gastric reflux, um, diarrhea, constipation. Um, it can, you know, anal glands, it can, it can show up in a, in a lot of different things. And if they're licking their paws after quite a bit after the meal, that, that could, that could point to, um, gut pain, right? So, you know, definitely, you know, an inflammatory response in the gut and the gut, the gut having pain. So, um, is it an elimination diet? The only way to know which food might be causing the issues. I do elimination. I don't, I don't want anyone to think that I'm saying to do an elimination diet in order to know what you're alert, what they're allergic to. I'm saying do an elimination diet to, lower the the inflammatory response in order to then work on healing your animal with allergies so so getting rid of the bear like removing the bear not just removing what's poking the bear and then something else is going to poke it and then something else is going to poke it you're not you have to get you have to get them out of there so the elimination diet just allows the body to have some kind of reprieve or or decrease inflammatory response so that just it just helps them be a little bit less aggravated while you can and it decreases the cortisol so if they're less itchy and they're less in pain and they're less all that then the cortisol levels decrease and then they then they can heal better so that's why that that's the reason that that we talk about elimination diet. Now, there's other things that you can eliminate too, right? Like go, I always say get a diary. That's like like that was like the number one. We started actually buying little um Cole's notes books like where where we we were so adamant that our patients, our patients our our, our clients purchased diaries for their animals that we just started with every new client, we would just give them one to be sure that they started like that day. There was no excuses. So, oh, I noticed that every time I went to the endowment lands, which was a, a, a really beautiful trail in, in, in Vancouver, um, they came home and they weren't itchy at all. They seemed fine. And even for the next couple of days, but when I take them on this trail, 
it's like the itching starts almost immediately. They're licking their paws. They're doing this. They're doing that. Or the the diarrhea happens almost instantly, or or whatever the 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 way the body is um, showing showing the allergies. So it's like okay, well then maybe I'm not going to take them back to the like you still work on the bear because if, if, if there was some wasn't something wrong that's causing it to be reactive with whatever's on that trail. You still need to to heal that, right? But for a while until it's healed, you want to try to remove that 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 poke, remove that inflammatory response. So then you just wouldn't go to um you would you just wouldn't go to that trail for a while. So elimination is not just elimination diet. Also, oh, he's always itchier after Thursdays. Well, what happens Thursdays? What what happens what happens prior to Thursday? So it's like, okay, well, every Tuesday he goes to daycare or every Tuesday there's hot, is it, Tuesday's our busiest day. Our family's going to soccer and then the dog's alone all day long, right? It's like, okay, so this, the dog's stress level is contributing to its, its overreactive immune, immune system, right? So it's not just always leaky gut. It's not just always food. It's not just always environmental and whatever, but, but the outside circumstances contribute to leaky gut. It, so, so understanding those outside um, contributors helps to also heal the gut, helps to also calm down the cortisol levels. Like it's just, um, it's a high level holistic approach. Like just because we say, oh, we're going to deal with the gut or we're going to deal with the liver or we're going to give it a raw food diet. That's not a, that's not a holistic approach. Holistic approach is understanding the entire um, cause of what's happening and, and what makes it worse, what makes it better, and then trying to make it better until you heal it. And then our goal is, has always been, and as a homeopath for, for people, your goal is not to remove your goal for your animals and your goal for your life is to enhance. So if you're having to take things out of your life that you like, including food, unless it's really bad for you, but including food, you're not enhancing your life, you're removing. So you don't want to be removing stuff. You actually want to be enhancing your life and making your body stronger. So that's how I look at that. Just want to make a comment. When we were talking, I was thinking about, because there's so many factors that can interfere, that it's important sometimes to keep a journal just to making notes of, what, of, uh, to make note of, of what's happening during these days and what happened when when it's well, that's, the di that's the diary I was talking about oh okay. <laughs> keeping a diary yeah. so a diary or a journal that's it, it it's so important we would give them to our, our our clients like every single new animal that came in left with the diary or left with the journal so that people could really start connecting the dots yeah Great. Um, Sarah is asking here, hi, Julie. Thank you for your amazing product. My cat has IBD. She did all blood work and fecal tests and everything else is great. The issue we are facing is food allergies or intolerances. I'm trying to avoid having to put her on steroids. She's currently eating minimal ingredient wet food as she refuses to eat raw despite my desperate attempts. She is seven years old and a picky eater, so it's a lot harder. I have tried her on pork, beef, lamb, chicken, duck, salmon, rabbit, as novel proteins, but even if her FACO score improves, she vomits and regurgitates. I'm not sure what's left to do. She seems um, she's allergic or has an intolerance to every protein. Is there anything I can do to reduce her allergy or help her gut biome to be able to tolerate proteins? I have heard terrible stuff about steroids, but I'm not sure what to do. So that's different. That's a hard one, right? And especially with cats, because cats don't tolerate steroids very well. They get steroid induced diabetes. And, you know, it's, it's not, that's not the best thing. Um, but I understand where you're coming from because you know, you, you, you need to try and, um, support your kitty no matter what, but this is a really, really good question. I want to tell everybody, um, why this is a good question because 
bacteria, when you, if you get a fecal test or a fecal analysis, right? So you check your dog's poop, check your dog's, your cat's poop, your horse poop, whatever. And it tells you it needs this, you know, it's too indulgent or too, there's too much of this particular bacteria, not enough of that bacteria. Just by adding the correct bacteria does not mean that you're going to heal the gut integrity. That They're two different things. Some, a lot of specific bacteria will help with the integrity of the gut lining, but it's probably that could bear. I'm not telling you that this, cause I have, don't know this case at all, but, but when I read that, that's what I hear. You know, I hear that no matter what you're giving her um, protein wise, it it's triggering her. And, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's possible that she's allergic or intolerant to every single protein. It's, it's rare when it comes to a, a carnivore, but not impossible. But that would say to me that if her bacteria is good, then it's her, it's her gut lining that is, that is traumatized. And it's her gut lining allowing those proteins to go through into the bloodstream and create that, that um, intolerance, right? So if I was you, I would be working on her gut lining and trying to get that integrity back. The other thing that I would do is I would, when I would look at this, rather than put giving her steroids, um, homeopathic medicine is brilliant when it comes to autoimmune diseases and allergies. Um, I would, I would reach out to my colleague, Andrea Ring, because I'm looking at that and, and, and there's a homeopathic remedy called carcinosin, which is just screaming at me. Um, it'd have to do, I'd have to do the case or she'd have to do the case for sure to, I, I'm not going to do it. I'm just saying someone, a homeopath would have to do the case, but sometimes an animal needs that extra boost with a homeopathic remedy. That's why we do have the homeopathy in the in the leaky gut protocols and stuff. And we have a lot of homeopathic remedies in all of our protocols for support. But that's what that's saying to me. It's saying that that she's got an immune mediated um, uh, issue where she is, you know, everything protein, she's reactive to everything protein. And she probably doesn't have a really strong gut um, uh, lining that the integrity of her gut lining is, is really weak. Thanks, Julie. So I'm, I will read Sue's question, but it's a really big one. So I'll ask everyone to be patient because there's three parts for this question. Um, Where, where's the other parts all the way down here? Yeah. Um, okay. so Sue is asking, asking, uh, we have a 12 year old retired mama Lagoto retired at six. We have struggled with one only yeast ear for multiple multiple years. Our vet has confirmed it it is it is it is yeast. She has no other itchy issues. Although her ear issue predated this, she had three surgeries for obstructions. Last one due to adhesions, adhesions, and uh, was antibiotics and pain meds. So I'm focused on her gut health. She is fed raw, not chicken, uh, not ch uh, and he and we stay away from any carb or natural sugar loaded treats, veggies, and she's on lots of great ABA supplements, including alternating phytos flora and healthy gut plus hemp oil and phytosynergy daily. We have also used the liver detox, although not in the last six months. We have teetered since we got her but she was definitely vaccinated as a breeding female i'm constantly monitoring and taking action as required we have done the east beast protocol plus at different times we have also used otic kin and kind organic ear cleaner apple cider vinegar and mct in her food and part three 
and in her food and um, cool it organic green tea to soothe the itchy. We also use the East Bees spray on the inside ear flap. All these, and we still have lots of dark brown waxy discharge in the, e in the one ear. I'm good at getting it settled down, but I'm obviously not getting uh, to the root cause because it is just waiting to resurface. Any suggestions mm -hmm. to help improve the situation? Yep, I'm just gonna go back up to the, the middle one <laughs> again. A lot. Um, yeast TBs. We have done the yeast TBs protocol plus different times. Okay, well, I would, I would, I would still go through a, a leaky gut protocol for sure because if 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 the if everyone could see what yeast look like under a microscope, it is a nasty spiny, disgusting looking thing that just plays havoc on the gut lining. Um, but what I would try is organic ear cleaner, apple cider vinegar, yet yeah, to be really careful. So cleaning their ear is one thing. Reducing the inflammation in the ear canal is like the the, the king of kings. That's what we, that's what you have to try and do. Um, part of that, I can just, I mean, I can always say, you know, colandria ring or do kelp carb or whatever, but I, what I would try is in, you probably don't have it because you haven't done a leaky gut protocol, but our rebalancer, it has something called thuya and silica in it. And thuya and silica are two homeopathic remedies that are, that really help to remove because it was our anti-vaccinosin, right? So it helps to um, remove the 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 chemicals like the the preservatives and the the mercuries and the thimerosals and stuff like that in the vaccinations. It also is really thuya and silica was one of the two remedies that I would use a lot in my practice for really bad yeast infections in their ears. So that and arnica and aconite so our go-to this is a real homeopathic actually answer so the two things that i would get right away from our from our from ava is the rebalancer or or go on the leaky gut protocol because then you get the rebalancer in it um and uh your go-to and i would actually be i would actually give the rebalancer three times a day for up to a month even along with go-to and the the go-to will help to decrease support the body to decrease the inflammation in the in the um the in the actual ear canal and the silica and the thuya will help to draw out because you need to get that stuff out and every time you clean it what you're doing is you're you're cleaning it but it, you do actually irritate the the ear canal so then it swells up a little bit more. So I would, and the other thing that I use, I don't know if you've ever tried it, is the non-steroid, so the non-hydrocortisone, uh, it's called Zymox, Z-Y-M-O-X. You can buy it on Amazon. Um, it is an enzyme for the ears. It's, it's brilliant. I used it in my practice all the time. And there's one, like I said, there's one with hydrocortisone. You don't want to be using that one. But the, and it's just the enzyme. Don't use the cleaners, don't use anything and don't clean your dog's ears and just try that with the two homeopathic remedies. That's what, that's what I would try. And you could also try the leaky gut one and put it and go back on, on liver tonic for sure. Great. Thanks, Julie. There's an anonymous question here. Is there a limit to how long a dog should be on the leaky gut protocol? Um, that's a good question. If it's, if you're going from zero to a hundred, so if your dog is really bad and you've started them on leaky gut protocol, you know to stop when your dog is basically not, or your cat, not showing any more symptoms of, of, of what you started the leaky gut protocol to begin with. So the leaky gut protocol can be given as a proactive approach before you even get any kind of um, 
uh, like that's the cool thing. You don't, your dog doesn't have to have, or your cat or your horse doesn't have to have leaky gut in order to go on the leaky gut or show symptoms of having leaky gut. Um, because once with blood work, I, everyone probably knows this, but with blood work, you know, by the time you actually see changes in the blood work, they say that 30% of that organ has already been, um, uh, really, really the integrity of that organ is really about 30% less. So it's the same holds true with leaky gut. If by the time you see symptoms of leaky gut, that's, it's been there for quite some time. So it doesn't hurt to start the leaky, no animal, it's not going to hurt any animal to put it on a leaky gut protocol as a prevention. So you can go on one course, like one, one protocol. And just as a, as a prevention, if your animal has symptomatology of an autoimmune disease, um, like an allergy or a reactivity or, or Cushing's or any kind of autoimmune issue, you give it until the symptoms aren't there anymore. You can just keep giving it. So long as it get, it's getting better, you don't just keep giving it and giving it and giving it in the dog or the cat or the horse isn't getting better. If it's not getting better, it's not it's not the right protocol. You're probably gonna have to switch them around. And, and, and like I said, you know, um, go through all the different probiotics, go through all the different protocols and, and address all the different sim systems of the body as well as removing stress and stuff from their environment and really looking at diet. But um, there is no, there's no like hardcore, this is how long you give it for. If the dog is better on it, stay on it. Like I have my horses, I've got horses on it that never can come off of it. They just, they don't have, they just had too much damage done to them and they're fine. They're healthy as clams when they're on it. And when they go off it within three weeks, I can see the difference again. So then I throw them back on it really fast. So then I just went to a point where they're just going to live on it. It's all, they're doing incredible. So it's not, there's, there's no harm in doing it. So if your animal is doing incredible on it, you can just stay on it, especially if you take them off of it and they need to go back on it. Um, you can pulse it. Sometimes you can, you know, do it. They're doing really well take them off for two months, put them back on it before they start to relapse again. You can play with it. You don't, there's no, there's no harm with, with, with playing with it and seeing how it works. Great. Thanks. Uh, Diana is asking here. Hello, pleasure. What herbs supplements would you recommend for seasonal allergies? Okay. Well, those are the ones that we went through, right? Mm -hmm. So we went the, where you saw those histamine, the anti natural antihistamines, um, definitely. Uh, all of the herbs that are in the liver tonic, uh, milk thistle and berberus and chelidonium and Um, quercetin, bromelain, vitamin C. You know everything that was in the in the the lecture that we just gave, and probiotics that have pre and probiotics that have immune modulating. Um, immune modulating benefits for sure. Great, thanks. Michaela is asking two year old raw fed since eight weeks, Labrador retriever, itchy paws, and one each ear. Any suggestions on what she can do about it? Eight weeks. Itchy paws and itchy ears. I would do the combination of leaky gut and yeasty beast right? Because eight weeks, since eight weeks of age, my feeling is that that puppy was probably born with a really, really, really not a very healthy gut. So, you know, um, and then I don't know whether it's gone out on antibiotics, if it's two year old, it's raw fed. I don't know. I, I don't know. But to me, it would be, it would be making sure it gets the leaky gut protocol and the yeasty beast protocol. And then in between those or after them, then definitely phytosflora, soil and sea and the wolf and alternating them so that you can get the most diversity. And with a puppy that's eight weeks old, really important to have 
species specific probiotics. So, you know, you can do, you could do either, right? You could go, okay, it was eight weeks old. It was born with a really unhealthy gut. Therefore it needs canine. It's probably going to need really specific canine bacteria. So the real specific canine bacteria is in Phytos flora and is in the wolf. So you could start off with, you know, a jar of Phytos flora, then go through a bottle of wolf, then go through a bottle of soil and sea, then go back to Phytos flora. You can alternate through those three things and see what happens. Or you can go right to like the deep seated core problem and you could do a leaky gut protocol finish that, then go on Phytos flora, finish that, then go on the yeasty beast protocol. Because what you're doing there is you're trying to heal the gut lining, which is what and you've got to do, heal the gut lining. Then you're going to go into giving it a species specific probiotic. So a probiotic that's made from the microbiome of, the, of a dog's gut. Um, and then you're going to go, okay, well, I'm going to now give it the yeasty beast protocol because probably yeast, if it's an ear and itchy ear and its feet, go through the yeasty beast protocol and then go on the wolf because then you're inoculating them with an even more genetically, you know, a deeper um, uh, genetic ancestry of, of, of a bacteria. And then you can you just start rotating through the whole thing. Great, thanks. Um, Caroline is asking, uh, 15 month old puppy is scratching. He's raw fat, so don't think it's the food and we live in the mountains, so no grasses, etc. Not sure if it's just itchy winter skin. What can I try to give him relief? Well, mountains, you know, usually it is it is drier weather up there. So I would start 15 months. I wish I knew what it was. I would probably do um, potency and for omegas. And then I would add potency and I would add um, phytos flora to that. I would, do, I would do a full thing of potency and a full thing of phytos flora and see, see where you're at. And then once you're finished the phytos flora, I would then continue potency and add the wolf. And then when you finish the wolf, I would probably move on to uh, soil and sea and still continue put doing the potency throughout the whole uh, throughout the whole time and see. And if it doesn't help after the first, even like if you're using potency and phytos flora and there's like no change then call customer service. And then I would probably go into one of the protocols. Amazing, thank you. Another anonymous question here. I have a customer who has six dogs, which are all itching, have completed the five strands and try to regulate with less sensitive proteins. Dogs have red bellies with sores. The dogs have been warmed and tested for mites. Dogs are all ages and different breeds. What's your recommendation for all of the dogs? That's a tricky one. All of them. Mm. If they all have red bellies and sores, I would say that's a contact allergy. So not mites, not worms, that the dogs are either, um, they're, they're contacting something, they're lying on something, there's some kind of a possible you know, um, detergent or pine sap or environmental chemical or because they have six itchy dogs or stress, <laughs> like really, really, really just massive stress. But to have the same symptomatology in six dogs, unless they're all related, um, you know, which could be, they could be a mother and five puppies. So that, that might be a bit different, but that sounds to me like, in a, like some kind of react, like something that they're, I guess, chemical sensitivity or something to something, mm. you know, in the meantime, it, again, organic cotton, bamboo, 
blankets, sheets throughout the whole house, like on every single place that they're going to lie their bellies on. Um, are always an oopsies mixed with, for this, always a noop. I would make a combination of our colloidal silver, always a noopsies, and chamomile in green tea and make a mixture of that and spray it on the dog's bellies and, and, and hair coat, if you can get it into their hair coat and um, see if they can sort of rebuild. The other thing that you can try and do is actually do a, a mask, you know, like a, a probiotic mask that we have. We have that on our website as well. But I would really be, I would be really concerned that there's something that they're having that is a contact allergy. It sounds a little strange that all six dogs have it. Great, thanks. Um, Dizel Mini is here asking, um, excessive itching, redness, hair loss, help. <laughs> That's it. Well, um, we're going to have this, we're going to have that, um, PowerPoint available for everybody, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, just make sure I would just go over the PowerPoint again. Excessive itching, redness, and hair loss is, you know, gut health, taking elimination diet, doing um, a journal, taking off the excess pollens and things as they're coming in, cotton sheets everywhere, um, and excessive itching, redness, and hair loss. I would be doing the leaky gut protocol, but I would also, don't know how old this dog is, might want to do a blood test and do a full thyroid panel, especially if there's hair loss. So you want to do a full thyroid panel with a T4, T3, a free T4, a 3T3, a, and a um, and a TSH. So don't just do a T4, do a full thyroid panel. You know, sometimes that, like if, if she's already on raw, a raw food diet and you've been looking at a lot of other stuff, you know, a, a big, a big cause of itchiness sometimes is, is thyroid disease, hypothyroidism. Thanks, Julie. So Tricia from Singapore, my pug has been doing well for five years and is on raw diet, but a few months back, she started scratching. Diet has not been changed and Singapore has no season change. Is this likely an allergy to a type of protein settling? Suddenly, thank you. Yeah. Um, it could be. It could be a something all of a sudden in your area that is like um, uh, has something to do with like a pollution, right? Some some type of some type of a uh, pollution that's that's happening. The the amount of dogs that are suffering with uh, asthma now and allergies that they didn't have because of global warming and you know, the, the amount of our, you know, our air quality is getting, is getting worse. And, uh, so it could, it could be something like that, but to stay on the same protein for five years, they can, they can all of a sudden get a sensitivity to it for sure. Like they, they, they can, you can, you know, some dogs can be on the same protein forever and not have any effect, but some dogs will, will develop a sensitivity. So I would, you know, first thing I would try to do, I don't know whether you're doing anything for their, for their microbiome of their gut, but probably put them on something like, um, phytosflora and an, a really good omega, like, like potency and change their, change their, uh, protein into something. Did you buy a new couch? Did you start a new softener? Are you lighting candles that have, a scent in them, um, anything like that, anything can cause a sudden change and, and start scratching. Anything environmental could, can cause that. So really dig into, have you changed anything and look, like, look at everything. Have you changed your perfume? Have you changed your, your soap? Have you changed your, you know, did you buy, like I said, did you buy a new couch? Did you buy a new duvet cover? Did you buy anything that could have some kind of fire retardant on it because that can cause them to be really itchy 
um you know that that would that would hold true too with that with that six dog being itchy did they buy a new couch that's got fire retardant on it because that's that can be a huge um issue for dogs and in, in getting chemical sensitivities or um uh, contact allergies so you know and then while you're doing that you could change it you could change the diet to uh another novel protein great thanks um hoping is, hope is asking do you recommend any particular environmental allergy tests <clears throat> that's a hard one I mean, they're all, they're all good. They're all good. But I find that like, what are you going to do? If you find out that your dog is allergic to grass, what are, what are you going to do? Um, if you can handle it, then if you can handle environmental allergy test, then, you know, go ahead and try to get some, as much information so that maybe you don't walk them through a you know, a willow stand, or maybe you don't, you know, you know, that you can sort of reduce it. My experience is that people look at those things and they become obsessed and they get really, really depressed because their animals are allergic to everything, or they're allergic to things that they just don't understand how they're allergic to them because they, that, you know, they would swear on their, you know, swear on everything that they'd never come in contact with that. So again, I don't, I don't recommend one over another. Um, and sometimes I, I um, um, you know, just just really prepare yourself to not get too freaked out by by them. And maybe for me, I always would tell people just what are you going to do if they're allergic to everything? Like, how are you going to feel? What are you going to do? So do you want to just, you know, some people want to know. And if that's the case then they glacier peaks and five strands like that you can there's no harm in doing both because they are they're different right like they they both offer different things so you might get insight doing doing both of them um but you know like i said prepare yourself for 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 being a little bit overwhelmed So there's nothing wrong. If you're not going to get overwhelmed, then don't worry and just do them. <laughs> and then just, you know, and then, and then you'll know, right. What you can do, you will do what you can't do. You won't be able to do, but no matter what you're doing, you're going to try to still get down to the original cause. Great. Thanks. Um, Leslie is asking here, I give my pup garlic for natural flea repellent. Can you guide me on how often and how much? And I'm kind of whinging, uh, whinging it. Any other advice or, or concerns with garlic would be lovely. And uh, there's two questions here. So I'm big into circadian biology for myself and starting to implement the lifestyle with my puppy. Getting sun on her skin, morning light together and anti-blue lights at night, very dim lighting as to avoid triggering daylight hormones at night, etc. Curious mm -hmm. what your perspective on this. Um, I'm thinking logically it makes sense in helping skin issues. Sun and our circadian rhythm has so many healing effects on the entire body, notably the gut. Any pet perspective on this would be awesome. I have an Aussie MT doodle, a little fluffy ball. How can I get the most out of the sun for her with her fluffiness? Maybe pets receive sun differently. Love to hear about it. Yeah, so that circadian rhythm is really important. Um, I'm I'm really anal about it with my barn, my horses, because uh we definitely you know we get the lights off when it's when it's when the lights are off and when we turn them on we turn them on for really short periods of time if we have it's like winter's worse clearly than 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 the summertime but i really support that because um i'm a big believer in you know i in in um our tides, our barometric pe pressures, our seasons, our, um, I think we are so innately affected by our environment from, from 
when it's supposed to be bright, when it's supposed to be dark, when it's, I think that that screws up all of us, including our animals for sure. So the way that they would receive that the most is, is predominantly through, um, through, through the, the light itself. So that's what you're doing is really good. What you're doing, just stay with, definitely stay with what you're doing. Don't, don't, don't think you're crazy. Don't think that you're doing anything wrong. You're not. It's, it's a really, really important, super important piece. And the closest that you can get to our natural rhythm of daylight and darkness is, is ideal. I mean, that, that is the ideal thing to do. Um, as far as natural garlic for flea repellent, you can definitely give too much garlic. So, um, their garlic is great for fleas, but you know, there's, there's other things that, that fleas are, are parasites. They, um, they, the healthier your animal is when we talk about immune modulation, the better. So when your puppy has a strong immune system, not an over strong immune system, but a strong immune system that in itself helps with fleas. So you can use garlic. I there's, there's lots of, I think Judy Morgan has a real, do we have a, do we have um a good garlic post, Emily? I don't, I don't know whether we have a good garlic post or not, but um, I think she said, she, she said we have, sec. yeah, she's looking. Yeah. Okay. So we can put that on. It'll have probably have amounts and stuff like that on it, depending. Um, yep. It's from Rita Hogan. Okay, great. Oh, Rita Hogan. Dr. Judy does have info on it too. Yeah. So Judy, Rita Morgan, uh, Rita Hogan, Judy Morgan, they all have, it's, it's, it's nice to read. Um, it's nice to read everybody's take on it. Again, I, I use garlic for my animals and my horses, but I don't do it all year long. I, I, I feel like it's something that should be ebbed and flowed or pulsed or, you know, rotated with other, with other natural flea, flea and, and, and insects, insect and repellents. Thanks. Julie, um, Denise is asking, will my 21 month old Mayo Vizla grow out of seasonal allergies. His eyes are weepy and eye ophthalmologist said there was no anatomical causes. Suggested it's allergies. No, I don't think it'll grow out of seasonal allergies. It's like, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I don't have a crystal ball and I don't know. Um, I don't know your dog, but Seasonal allergies are something where in that season, at some point, your dog has become reactive to that specific thing. So working with the cause and in, in allowing your dog to become um, immune, basically, to things that it shouldn't be reactive to is the, is the, is the way you want to go. So when you think of the immune system and you think of vaccinations and you think of you know, stimulating the immune system to create the proper amount of um, antibodies, not the over over amount of antibodies or, or overreactivity to that antibody. That's what you want to do. So I've never I've never known an animal to grow to grow out of it before. So I would be addressing it for sure. I think you're, are you muted? Yeah, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> uh, Nancy is saying here, my dog had been taking cytopoint injections. Yeah. What do you think about these uh, shots? And do you have any, uh, an alternative that I can start giving her this season? Yeah, so it would be, cytopoint is still similar. It's just not as hardcore. So I would be doing everything that we talked about, about immune modulation, like everything. Um, nasal congestion from environmental allergies. So, so again, um, when you think of congestion, when I look at, na when I hear nasal congestion, specifically from environmental allergies, you've got to deal with immune modulation. You just have to. 
but I also think of what helps with decreasing the inflammatory response of the mucosal lining. And that is an acetylglucosamine is like brilliant for that. So during those environmental allergy times, gut soothe is really good. Gut soothe and um, the gut soothe rebalancer and go to is really a really, really, really good things to have in your kit to decrease the inflammation of mucosal lining, especially around the eyes. So the person that was talking about with the eyes, um, you know, the colloidal silver uh, is really great for eye stuff. Um, and N-acetylglucosamine because it's the mucosal lining that gets inflamed. Um, euphrasia, homeopathic euphrasia works really well. So nasal congestion, you want to start, you want to try and decrease that. So I would be doing the rebalancer, the go-to and, um, and gut sooth for sure. I would, I would at least start with those three. Great. Thanks, Julie. And, um, well, I I'll just that... say this, can, okay. can allergies make anxiety <laughs> worse and vice versa? A billion percent. 100%. An animal that is in constant itch can definitely be more anxious. And an animal that is really anxious can definitely become more itchy. So, yes, to Stephanie on both accounts. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, so I was saying that we still have some questions here, and I apologize that we couldn't go over everything today, but it's getting very late, especially for us. Um, so I would say to for those who didn't get their answer today, please join our community community on Facebook, the Door Beast Collective. Uh, you can post your question there, and we'll be glad to help you. Um, and the guys, I'm so because I'm finishing, I just want to um, thank you, everyone, to, uh, for joining us today. I guess we had a record today of uh, attendees, uh, which is awesome. So thank you so much for staying with us until this time. And uh, of course, I always like to thank you, Julie, for your time here with us. Uh, I don't know if you want to say some final words. Um, just, uh, happy spring. And for those people out there that, um, have allergies, I just looked at someone saying that the, the yeasty beast was, uh, hard that they, they didn't, the dog didn't do well on yeasty beast. Renee, I think her name is definitely reach out to customer service. Cause I look at that and I, and I instantly think that, it probably has so much yeast that that you did get a herx, right? It just it just it just happened. So if you reach out to Kaylin, I can talk to Kaylin about this after too for Renee. Um, but happy spring and you know try allergies can be really tough, really 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 tough, really depressing, really scary. But if you can keep your head on and really work through with a journal and um kind of go like okay what's what is the exciting cause like look, we got to get down to you know to this so how do we reduce the suffering right away you know and for those of you guys that are on that's one thing i forgot that i wish i'd said at the very beginning for the for the animals out there that are on atopica and all that don't beat yourself up don't just whip them off of it because you don't want to do that. You want to slowly be incorporating the immune modulation. And while you're talking to your vet about reducing, reducing the suppressive drugs, if you just take them off, you're going to get a rebound effect and your dog's going to get way worse or your cat's going to get way worse. So you want to give them some reprieve, some relief, but you can more be working on them on the allergies um, at the same time. It doesn't have to be one or the other ever. It doesn't have to be one or the other. So thank you, everybody. Have an amazing night and a wonderful spring. Mm. Reach out to customer service if you have more questions. Um, if they can't answer them, then they ask me. Yeah. So, yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Thanks thank you, Julie. Have a, have a wonderful night.
Thank you. Uh, I wish you all a great night and don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter. You can sign up on our website to get all the information about Adobe, our promos, new blog postings and future Ask Julie any, Anything sessions. I see you guys in May and uh, have a good night. Thank you so much. Good night. Bye. Bye.